Forgive me if you're sick of these talks starting this way, but I'd like to start out with the story of my short-lived career as a drug runner. <laughs> Picture this. I'm sitting on a Greyhound bus, sweating more than normal. In my backpack is a locked doctor's bag full of illegal substances that I'm hand-delivering to one of my favorite punk rock musicians of all time as a personal favor. The situation is equal parts, a nightmare, and my fantasy, as this is someone whose cassette tapes I wore out in high school. As I was sitting on the bus thinking about how stupid this was, I remember thinking, if I don't get caught, this has to somehow figure into my upcoming TED Talk. <laughs> I'm going to come back to this later to really pump up the suspense factor. I'm not telling this story, by the way, in order to brag. In fact, my parents and my 96-year-old grandmother who are here will probably reprimand me for it the minute I get off stage. <laughs> the reason I'm telling the story is because I also remember thinking, how did I get here? How does one go from listening to these bands in high school to becoming friends with them and peers and gaining a level of trust over the course of 20 years? There is no real answer. I think that not having a roadmap can be a positive thing in the sense that it forces you to forge your own way. For example, if I had overthought or planned too much what I wanted to do with my life, I wouldn't be here working with these bands and mediums that didn't even exist when I was a kid, such as podcasts and web series. I recently interviewed my friend Jeremy Bohm, who sings for a band called Touche Amore, and while we were talking, he said something that really stuck with me. He said, punk rock stunts your growth. And while on the surface I think that's true, I think what Jeremy meant to say was that it challenges the traditional notions of growing up, in the sense you don't have to act or dress a certain way, just because you've reached an age. Now, through my experiences, I've been able to gain a unique view on this world, because I've grown through it. Um, now, punk rock in general is often viewed as a juvenile phase that kids go through, but from my experiences, that's also a misconception. In fact, some of the most brilliant minds around, such as PhD and bad religion singer Greg Graffin, to media personality Henry Rollins, have all been associated with the musical scene that's often written off as juvenile, a big misconception I believe is changing. Now, through my own experiences, I've learned a lot about this world, and it's, for me, I feel like it's just, it's a lot of those misconceptions I would like to change. So, for my talk, I'd like to say that, to begin, I wasn't always this cool. <laughs> As a child, I never really felt like I fit in because I wasn't good at sports or socializing, and I had bifocals and liked to wear Hawaiian shirts. An interesting choice considering Cleveland's climate. <laughs> I started playing guitar at age 13 and discovered punk rock at 15 through Epitaph's Punkorama compilation, which featured no effects, rancid, and bands like Gas Huffer. I instantly started my first band, which was called Plug. We played the Orange Hill Talent Show and almost got it permanently canceled after our singer Matt spit in the audience and started a mosh pit. <laughs> the principal was super mad but I remember feeling excited at the fact something we created could spur such a frenzied reaction from my peers, even if they were technically legally mandated to be there. <laughs> Soon I recruited a group of friends and we would hang out in Coventry, smoke cigarettes, rummage through the racks of Record Revolution, and play Gigi Allen and Misfits covers at places like the Equal Tavern. Now this was a point where this type of music you really had to dig for it, and I think the fact that it seemed so obscure and enigmatic was what made it so impactful to me on a personal level. I would lock myself in my room with my guitar and look really angry and <laughs> practice these songs over and over. Sometimes I would write handwritten notes to my favorite bands and get letters in response with uh, stickers or patches or other things. And that was very, very important to me because I realized that my favorite bands were people too not elevated above me like the pop stars I saw on television, but relatable on a personal level. Luckily, adolescence didn't last forever, and I ended up going to Ithaca College, where I started joining in with a group of kids who, like me, favored Jinko jeans and facial piercings. This was from my band Mumra, and I think we play, played at a youth center or something. Uh, anyways, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, so I chose to be an exploratory major which meant taking classes from different departments in hopes of eventually finding a major. Um, I eventually settled on television radio, and um, while I was interested in that, it didn't really, I didn't really have a lot of passion about it. Luckily, I met a guy named Ross Siegel soon after who did a zine called Law of Inertia. Um, and essentially, I started out writing for the zine even though I had no experience, then co-editing the review section, and eventually co-editing the magazine with Ross. Now, if you're maybe under the age of 30, you might not be familiar with zine culture. Essentially, 
Before there were blogs, you would basically cut and paste together your own magazine, making having a friend who worked at Kinko's a very valuable commodity. <laughs> now, me and Ross would do all the interviews ourselves, usually go to shows, ask the bands afterwards if we could talk to them, record an old school tape recorder, and take pictures with disposable cameras. Law of Inertia was one of the nicer zines around. It was perfect bound, we had a lot of ads, and it was distributed at places like the Virgin Megastore and Tower Records. Now, whereas I wasn't really super passionate about my schoolwork, I completely threw myself into the zine, often at the detriment of my classes. Luckily, the classes I was taking, such as Why Is the Sky Blue, weren't incredibly labor intensive. <laughs> My duties at the zine led to an internship at Alternative Press Magazine here in Cleveland, where I worked in the art department. Now, despite the fact I was in the art department, I managed to talk my way into doing my first interview for them with Blake Schwarzenbach from Jets to Brazil around the release of their album Four Cornered Night. I continued writing for the magazine, and when I was 21 and taking summer classes in Ithaca, they flew me to England with a band called Jimmy World, who were about to release a record called Bleed American that would launch them into the stratosphere. I remember flying over there and being at Heathrow Airport and then wondering why I just had a backpack and a return ticket for two days later. When I explained that I was a student, they still didn't understand. And when I explained I was on an assignment to hang out with a rock band who were on tour with Weezer, the woman said, well, then you're a rock journalist. I couldn't even say it myself at this point. Now, after school, I ended up being hired by AP to work on the Warp Tour for eight weeks. This was an amazing experience in the sense that it was I didn't have a job, I was 22 years old, and I was living on a tour bus with 22 other people. Um, the negative part was that those same clicks that frustrated me during adolescence were once again present between some of the bands and the crews. Luckily, eventually I fell in with a group of musicians from bands such as Thursday, Motion City Soundtrack, who we kind of related on the same level. Um, in that tour, I have some really crazy stories from, but that would be a totally different talk. Now, luckily, following my time on the Warp Tour, I was actually hired by AP as their music editor at the age of 22. Um, this was a really, really, really great experience, and I ended up interviewing some of my favorite bands, including uh, NoFX. Um, now, this cover, actually, was their first interview in seven years, and I flew to LA, went to their office. I remember I was almost as sweaty as I was on that Greyhound bus, and uh, we got a lot of complaints about this because it was supposed to be mocking the Dixie Chicks Entertainment Weekly cover that was really popular at the time, but parents didn't understand why there were four naked middle-aged guys in their mailbox. <laughs> yep. But I mean, I spent a lot of time with you know, the guys from Good Charlotte, I wrote a cover story on them, and just really kind of explored that scene. And it was a really exciting time to be at AP. Bands like Fall Out Boy, Motion City Soundtrack, um, My Chemical Romance, AFI, were all transitioning from this underground warp Tour scene into the mainstream consciousness, and we were at the forefront of that. Um, now, following my time at AP, I sort of, well, while I was at AP, I was also playing in a band called The Love Kill, and I ended up leaving to do a five-week tour of Europe with them. And this is from a show, I believe, in Berlin. Now, these, this was not the typical tour you see in films, like Almost Famous. This was tours with in squats with communal living, free beer, and no fire codes. I remember this show in particular, it was so cold in Berlin that the toilets in the venue froze over and all of the glass bottles in our van exploded. Now, while this was not the most comfortable tour, it kind of showed me another side of the music industry that I wasn't used to. Eventually, like most bands, we broke up and I decided to move to Brooklyn, New York seven years ago. Once I got out there, I was freelancing for a few places, but didn't really know what I was going to do. Luckily, I met up with a guy named Stephen Smith, who worked on a show called Stephen's Untitled Rock Show that he hosted on Fuse. Stephen hired me to write for the show, even though I had absolutely no experience writing. I have to admit, it was pretty surreal to write questions for bands like The Foo Fighters, Pictured Here, or Fall Out Boy, and then go down into the studio and see Stephen actually asking the questions to my bands. Now, this was also sort of the first time I forayed into comedy a little bit, because I was friends with a lot of the bands at this point. So I'd write in obscure kind of anecdotes about them into the show and watch them squirm. I would, I would also work my own personal preferences into the scripts, because there's no real accountability for me. It was coming out of Steven's mouth. So he would constantly talk about how much he hated the film Juno in between videos, even though he probably liked it. Um, 
Another memorable moment from Stephen's Untitled Rock Show was when Scott Weiland was a guest. He came on at 10 in the morning and requested a six-pack of Heineken and asked if he could smoke in the studio. The answer was no, you cannot smoke in the studio because there's lots of expensive equipment. Uh, we had Stephen ask him some fan questions, and when he asked Scott Weiland what his favorite book was, he struggled with the question seemingly forever before answering The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. This was not our best episode. <laughs> Sensing that our time on the air was maybe limited, Stephen decided to do an entire show where he slept through each video. We were canceled soon afterwards. <laughs> Luckily, this was not the end of my relationship with Stephen, and a couple years ago, we started a podcast called Going Off Track, which has seen us interview everyone from Fred Armisen to Janine Garofalo to members of bands like Minor Threat, Taking Back Sunday, and Fall Out Boy. Um, we recently celebrated our 100th episode with a sold-out live show in Brooklyn at Union Hall featuring Janine Garofalo. After I moved to New York, I also started a band called United Nations with Jeff from Thursday, who I also met in that Warped Tour back in 2002. We have our second record coming out this summer, and we've played everywhere from Brooklyn to Belgium. Um, in addition to writing for places like The Vice is Noisy and The Onions AV Club, my latest endeavor is called Sound Advice with Janessa Slater, a web series I co-created with my sister and Saturday Night Live cast member Vanessa Bayer. Now, this is a photo of us with no effects nine years after I wrote that cover story of them, and it's from an upcoming episode, but to date we've released episodes with Grammy-nominated acts such as Fun and Amy Mann. So, I guess that's sort of my life story, but what does it mean to you? Well, as you might imagine, most of the people I met over the last 10 or 15 years ended up moving on from this world, having families, and kind of losing their ties. And while that's a perfectly reasonable path, it doesn't mean it's the only way. In fact, as you can see from what I just said, a lot of the people I met back then, such as Jeff or Steven, became a huge part of my life, both personally and professionally. Now, a question I get asked a lot is how people can follow a similar path. And I'd like to sort of paraphrase what Patton Oswalt told me in an interview that I did for AP a while back. He said, there are no shortcuts. If you want to be a stand-up comedian, start doing open mic nights. If there isn't an open mic night, start one. I think the same can be said of success in any creative field. And luckily, these days, starting a blog is so much easier than cutting and pasting a zine and so much less messy. I would also like to say a few things. A, be prepared to work for free early on, and also be prepared to make enemies. I could give a completely other, different talk about all the bands who thought we were friends before I did my job and gave them a negative review. Remember that while having friends is great, Having integrity is paramount, as Lester Bangs, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, explained in the film Almost Famous. Unfortunately, this is a very small consolation when a band who bring a bench press on tour want to talk to you because you call them John McCain's favorite band in a lead review. <laughs> now, on the other end of the spectrum, this is a photo of me taken with the band Saves a Day on my 34th birthday earlier this year. Uh, Saves a Day were the first band I ever wrote a cover story on for AP back when I was still in college. And, and earlier, before, the day that this photo was taken, their singer Chris Conley came on my podcast and we talked about meditation, spirituality, and yoga, topics that we'd both become very interested in as adults. Now, if I had never started the zine or got involved in this world, I probably would still listen to this music, but I wouldn't have the opportunity to have these relationships and dialogues over the course of decades and to me, that's an incredibly satisfying feeling. So ultimately, I'd also like to say that failure is a huge part of the process for a long time. So don't let society or other people's perceptions of what you should be doing at a certain age discourage you. Understand that life isn't black or white, and you don't have to start worrying about your 401k the minute you get out of school. Now, maybe that means ice skating a couple days a week, even if you know you'll never be a professional, or, not, or spending a couple hours on the weekends working on your screenplay, instead of watching football with your friends. Look at the career of someone like Fred Armisen. He started out playing in a band called Trench Mouth, then made goofy videos with his friends, which landed him on SNL, and now he does Portlandia and plays in Seth Meyers' live band. In retrospect, it's really easy to connect the dots to see how people got to where they are, but part of the fun of the journey is that unknown, and as long as you're pushing forward, you'll be heading somewhere at least, instead of stagnating. Do you remember that thing that you couldn't wait to get home and do the minute you got home from school? That feeling doesn't have to go away just because you've matured emotionally. 
It's still a part of you, and it's something worth holding on to. Because ultimately, when you look back on your life, those are the things that make you and your experience on this planet unique. Oh, and the drug running? It went great, like a pro. <laughs> Although, it's not something I would ever try again, unless it was for a band I really liked. Thank you.